Please be seated. I love the imagery that St. Paul uses in his epistle to the Corinthians that we heard today about feeding. We often talk about being fed by the sacraments, by the word of God. And what he says to the people is, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. And even now, you are still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. And at this particular moment in, in my life and in Pete's life, we are uh, at a point of feeding soft food to a developing young little adorable puppy who is, can be a little terror. <laughs> And it stinks. I, that food stinks, but she loves it. And I know it's good for her, and she's growing. She's growing so fast and developing, and she needs this for her, not just her growth, but her strength, her, her brain development, her organs, the whole thing. So we do it. But I look forward to the day when I can serve her the solid food that doesn't stink and that she can possibly peacefully eat alongside our other dog. We shall see. But what St. Paul is talking about is more of a spiritual maturity rather than a physical one. And the theme today was some very challenging words, especially those of Jesus, I think is about not getting out ahead of ourselves. Now, I have a habit, and it was worse back in my younger days. It's, it's gotten better but of confusing my own uh, will and my timeline with those of God. It was especially acute during the ordination process because I, like so many of my colleagues, cohort, were so eager. We felt the call and we wanted to get out there and, and do God's work, but there's a process and it's a very lengthy process. It can be um, traumatic at times, and certainly there are things that could be done better, I think. Um, people have been hurt, but overall, by and large, the process works. It is rigorous for a reason, and some people don't make it all the way for a reason. And we are all called to do something in God's church, but not everyone is called to be a priest. Not everyone is called to be a bishop. And we experienced that work of the Spirit back in December at the electing convention when we had five really wonderful candidates and eventually got down to the one who will be, um, in the coming years, our bishop diocesan. But in this process of ordination, I was oftentimes upset and disappointed because I wanted to just shoot straight through. The first disappointment came uh, when my bishop called me in and um, said, I want you to pay off all of your credit card debt before you go to seminary. I thought that was so unfair. But he was right <laughs> in the end. It was, seminary's not cheap. And uh, to go into it with debt already would have been a big mistake. So thank you, Bishop Jenkins in heaven for that. But, uh, but I was really upset. And so this, this idea of confusing our own will with that of God is something that is not, uh, it's not uh, proprietary to me, let's put it that way. And it's not uh, only of our time and place. So you see these, peop these uh, Corinthians are getting confused because Paul planted the seed, he started the whole thing up, he put Apollos in charge. Apollos watered it. But as he said, it was God who gave the growth, not these two human men. It is attempting to uh, idolize a, a charismatic figure or someone you really respect and think that they can do no wrong and try to model your life um, against theirs. And it makes it all the more disappointing and disheartening and disillusioning when their humanity comes to bear, when they make a big mistake, when they fall 
from grace because we are all humans and we all fall short of the glory of God. And so this is why we try to stay as humble as we can, especially servants of God who are in an ordained capacity. Uh, our liturgy, as ornate as it can be, is all about being one with God. It's, it's about being, not being ourselves, but being one with God. Taking out personal uh, idiosyncrasies, taking out um, things that would identify us. Of course, you, you know who I am. I'm standing here talking to you, and you can see my face and hear my voice. But the point, especially when we're in the midst of the celebrating the Holy Eucharist, is that you don't see me, you don't see Rick up there. You, we all join into the body of Christ. And that's why I wear, well, my priests wear vestments actually. It's uh, supposed to sort of blend us into the surroundings and not be um, you know, a suit or some sort of fashionable clothing that might distract you from, uh, from, the, from the liturgy. And so this is, again, we, don't, we, we do these things so that we don't get out ahead of ourselves. And I think this is what Jesus is really pounding home in his message in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, we all have done at least one of the things that he says not to do in this list. And he promises some pretty severe punishments as well. The first and foremost is, you shall not murder, but he says to you, if you are even angry or if you call someone a bad name, that's even worse. So remember to be reconciled. If you are having a quarrel with somebody, make sure that you work it out before it gets out of control. And the part about adultery, commitment to your spouse, but also commitment to other loved ones and commitment to fellow human beings, fidelity in that way, is of the utmost importance. Because so much of our lives depend upon trust. Trust is something that is very, very easily broken and is very, very difficult to regain once that has happened. And so again, this self-control, this being aware of the world around you, getting outside of yourself. I've heard that said to me once. I was panicking about something, and my sister Lauren, she's so wise, and she's uh, one of my go-tos for advice. She said, if you could just get outside of yourself for a second, whoa, <laughs> you, you nailed it, and take a look at this situation from a different angle. And she was right. And so Jesus ends with, you shall not swear falsely. Do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is footstool, his footstool, or Jerusalem, for it is the city of a great king, or by your head. For you cannot make one hair white or black. Would that I could. But yes, yes, no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. It sounds very simplistic and like Jesus is telling us to just be sort of a yes man or a yes woman. Just to go along, go with the flow. But I don't think that's what he's saying here at all. Again, it's not getting caught up in your own head, not getting caught up in your own ego, trying to see things from other people's points of view. And so when he's talking about swearing by earth or heaven or Jerusalem, um, he's talking about you know, us getting super entrenched in our own thoughts. My way or the highway? And boy, do we see that on full display so much these days in our lives, in our world, in our politics. Uh, it's, there's no room to look at things from other people's perspectives. There's no room to 
think that possibly we could be mistaken or misguided or misinformed. There is just no room for anything but self. And that is sin. That's what sin is. And we heard in the passage from Sirach, he did not give anyone permission to sin. Well, that turning in on yourself, making yourself the focus of everything, is sin. Because what is the opposite of sin? Sin is opening ourselves up to others. Sin is opening ourselves to the will of God, true, the true will of God, not what we think God's will should be. But having that sense, that ability to be quiet and to be patient and to be discerning, and it's not easy, and we don't always get it right. In fact, we get it wrong a lot. But I think the, it's important to have our hearts at least in the right place. Sirach says, there is great, for there is the wisdom of the Lord. He is mighty in power and sees everything. His eyes are on those who fear him, and he knows every human action. He has not commanded anyone to be wicked and has not given anyone permission to sin. No one has been commanded to be wicked, and yet, here we are. We have that problem of sin that is in the world mixed with free will. And those two are a very dangerous combination and can, as you know from your history, lead us down some very, very dark pathways. But the hope is there is also light. Sirach also says, he has placed before you fire and water. Stretch out your hand for whichever you choose. Before each person are life and death, and whichever one chooses, one will be given. Shall we choose light and life? Shall we choose darkness and death? Those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ always must strive to choose light and life and love, because those are the things that are of God. God is light, God is life, God is love. And he created us in his image. And though we are fallen and broken, we have through the mercy and gift of Jesus Christ, grace. Grace to forgive each other and to forgive ourselves and to repent and return to the Lord. Repentance isn't a one-time thing. Repentance is a process throughout your life. It literally means turning again. So we turn again, we turn again, we turn again in our journey. And even after we leave this mortal coil, we go on to a new life. We say in the burial rite, life is changed, not ended. And we pray that the, 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 that the departed will go from strength to strength in the life of perfect service in the kingdom of God. So our vocation as Christians goes on into eternity. So that's really something to think about. And so while we are here, it is important that we make, our, make the best of it. And in the face of all that would uh, discourage us, depress us, ask us, uh, lead us to ask, why bother? We must press on. We must do the good work and fight the good fight. For before each of us are life and death. And whichever one chooses, one will be given. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.